Greetings, future fossils. That was Golden Child off my new fingerstyle guitar EP Mudras, which you can listen to anywhere you go to stream music. Seemed appropriate to start this week's episode with that one for reasons I'm sure will become very swiftly apparent. I am speaking to you from the edge of the universe, or perhaps it is the eye of the hurricane of insane metamorphosis that seems to have been sweeping over all of us lately. Never felt so confident in my diagnosis that Burning Man in its transmutation into the virtual for 2020 with the extremely appropriate multiverse theme has in fact finally after years of my preaching for it come home has penetrated and saturated the default world and now i've never felt more like living here in my own home in santa fe is like being at burning man with all of its chaos and unpredictability synchronicity magical possibility hardship drama promise it is from this vortex that i invite you into the latest episode a future fossils where we're going to take a, a hard right angle turn from last week's scholarly exploration of the weird with Sean Espion Hargens and into a heartfelt conversation with artist John Morrow, with whom I feel a remarkable kinship and uh, admittedly also kind of an envy at the extraordinary opportunities that this guy has had in his career as an illustrator and a fine artist working for people like the Dalai Lama and uh, his friend Jason Mraz. But, you know, he's living evidence of how someone with a pure heart and a, a strong artistic focus. Yes, my baby girl. <laughs> I'm recording an episode intro. Uh, you know, is is able to walk through walls and into really, really beautiful situations like those. I remember in, in ayahuasca ceremony six years ago, I came out of it with this, this line that has kept with me forever since, which is that you can walk through walls if you walk with respect. And John Morrow is a perfect teacher of this lesson. But before we get into that, I want to give a thanks to everyone who has been supporting this show on Patreon. I think most of you know, if you've been listening for a while, that I'm extremely busy with work at the Santa Fe Institute and now also at the Long Now Foundation. And that if it were not for the support of you patrons, that this show simply could not exist. So thanks to everybody who's been chipping in a few bucks a month, including the new patrons, Ali Rose, Matthew King, and uh, Chad Eveslage. Uh, thank you all so much. And uh, please continue if you haven't become a patron yet or you've had to take a temporary break and you're thinking now is a good time to hop back in, I am in the midst of a flurry of recording new music, really uh, kind of profound and, and strange studio songwriter compositions, as well as releasing some uh, private patrons only writing about uh, technology and evolution and the future and past of human experience. And I'm going to be putting out a couple of uh, additional new patrons only episodes, stuff that for one reason or another just isn't going to make it to the public feed. Also recent book club recordings. I mean, it's, it's just a cornucopia of rare and special treats that I get to share with all of you. Also, please uh, hit me up by email, futurefossilspodcast at gmail.com if you'd like an invite to our special Discord server where we've had a very active and interesting conversation building over there, a really wonderful and intimate group of amazing people in the Discord server. And also, members of the Discord are invited into the Collaborative Future Fossils music and podcast Spotify playlists. So if any of that sounds interesting, yeah, drop me an email or uh, become a patron and send me a message on Patreon. 
Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to everybody who has been sharing the show on social media or with their friends. <laughs> enjoy the bird song of my baby girl in the background and uh, enjoy this lovely conversation with artist John Morrow. And then uh, tune in again soon for a couple of other really excellent episodes in the pipeline. <laughs> Thanks, and I'll talk soon. Actually, before we start, clear your palate with this short piece from the Mudra EP, Pachinko, and then stick around after the conversation for what I consider the single from this EP, Sun Shower Before Dawn. <laughs> Hey, look at this. Look at this adorable person. Oh, hi there, Snooks. How are you? I'm John. Say hi, John. Did you go to the zoo? Did you go to the zoo? Did we get a zoo day in? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we went. Today is just uh, the world tarot card kind of a day. Oh, yeah. It's like uh, we went to the zoo. There was a, ba- a three year old birthday party two blocks from our place. All of my friends were there. And then um, this call is happening. Bill and Ted face the music. I'm going to watch that later tonight. Is it out? And it is. Yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, we're putting we're putting an offer in on a house. Congrats, brother. That's so good. Listen, I was beyond, like, seriously, I was beyond honored to be. I'm, I, I feel like I'm way outside the, the caliber of people you bring on the show, but I just mostly just loved your creative gumption with which you lived your life and going after it you know it's really it's really admirable and i love just championing people who are doing these very almost um prosaic things that support the life that they're you know living and it just feels like the universe is slowly but surely coming into alignment with you with wife and child and house and yeah you're you're living every, every well we can talk i know we're recording now but every ceremony i've ever done has always brought me back radically to right here and now. Like this is where the work needs to be done. And you're doing it. Yeah. Well, it's it's funny. It's like, it seems like, you know, this is the week of Burning Man 2020 that is and is not happening. Yeah. And there's something kind of magical in that, in that, you know, I've dedicated my entire adult life to like bring it home, bring this, bring this creativity, bring this, ferocious energy of inspiration and synchronicity and, and purpose and, and, and joy, uh, bring it back into the rest of your life. Like, I don't like the default world duality, you know? And so this feels like we're anchoring something at least this year. Yeah. So, so here we are, John Morrow. I am honored to have you on future fossils, man. I don't know. I don't know how you found me, but I'm glad you did because your work is extraordinary. I am like an impulse buyer for everything that you have created. I'm, I'm just like one click away from you just have an aesthetic that speaks to my soul. Tell me a little bit about yourself though, because like, you know, I, I was on your, project you know we, we talked for your this film you're putting together but i really want to know about you the creator and where you are and where you find yourself situated in time and what all of this means to you wonderful thank you well so yeah my name's john morrow i'm an artist and designer and filmmaker and author and, you know, have a lot of hyphens between what I do. Um, but really, you know, I, I, I grew up in Vermont and so nature was my first God and, you know, looking under rocks and logs and mosses and ferns. And 
I've always been enchanted by the natural world uh, in its super saturated colors and its incredible intricate fractal patterns and the the way that everything is a portal into the divine you know you could you could hold a leaf in your hand and sort of follow it or look into it or or hold it and contemplate all the way to something to its origins and be instantly i've always been instantly blown away by where are we what is this in my artwork and my soul searching and my seeking and my deep dives into consciousness and creativity have always just aimed to ask questions those questions and hope that the viewer i hope that my artwork can become a portal into that same place i, I know that i'm at best a finger pointing to that same actual and proverbial moon so where i find myself let's see right now i think it's an interesting time these times it's like where do you find yourself geographically and where do you find yourself like biographically right so geographically i find myself in vacaville california which is about an hour north of san francisco and it's uh we just had huge fires here we just got evacuated and i'm on this farm this regenerative agriculture farm called the bee love farm and everything around us, this is last week, got burned to a crisp. And somehow we have this miraculous, like, emerald miracle uh, here. And I think, you know, you can, you can play that up to the winds. You can play that up to, um, you know, the green, the greenery rather than the yellow grasses. Or you could play it up to karma or the good deeds of the owner. But either way, it's been... I had a whole initiation in fire last week. And uh, this time I've spent on the farm, I, I became kind of a COVID refugee. I was just, I've been, was been back and forth between Portland, Oregon and, and uh, Los Angeles. And um, I happened to come through here right when COVID broke out. And, uh, you know, at, at the beginning, it was like, oh, well, this is going to be, this is going to be, you know, two, two weeks, we'll see. Or it'll be, it'll be lifted by Easter. Or like, you know, there was all of these these hypothetical times when we thought that it was going to be over. Um, and I just knew in the, in the, in the quandary of all, uh, with the craziness happening, I'd much rather be here. If things were going to go down, a farm was a great place to sort of be. And so I didn't know that I was going to have earth school in my curriculum, but I'm so glad it was on the 2020 syllabus. So yeah, regenerative agriculture has been my latest teacher in these times. Why do you make things? I can't not. It's like a, it's a, the way, you know, why does a heart beat? Why does a, <laughs> why does my lungs breathe? Uh, my constitution needs to, I think it's the response to my call of why, you know, like, so why? And then, you know, I, I, I do make things is the, is the response. So why do, why do we exist? Uh, why is there creation at all? Why is there, why have we incarnated? I, it feels like a natural extension of, and the na natural extension and a natural response to the gift of, of existence for me. And I, you know, I ask questions through it. I, I hope to join the, you know, the great chain of being and the, um, to be a loyal student and disciple of, of creativity itself. So I love, I love it as a path practice and teacher of my own, um, you know, earth and, artistic stewardship. Well, so, so like, how did you come to that sensibility? I mean, certainly you were probably encouraged, nourished as a child, right? By your parents, by your community to create, but like, what's the larger beyond that? What's the larger context? Like, who do you, who do you think you're serving mm -hmm. by doing this, this yeah. work? Uh, I would say great questions. I would say, I don't know if it's a who as much as a what or a why, you know, and I don't mean that to sort of evade the question. You know, art was my first language in the same way people learn their ABCs, how to speak and how to communicate art as the way that I communicate with sentience, <laughs> you know, in general. And so I, I did have encouraging parents. I'm, I'm a, my, I have two younger brothers and we're all um, highly creative, but our parents were not. And uh, I mean, everyone is, I think, in, in their own way, but we didn't have artistic parents. I think they didn't know exactly sort of, they, they certainly encouraged it, but didn't necessarily know how to cultivate it. And 
I, you know, I had a first grade teacher who took my parents aside and said, I think we have an artist here. You know, most kids are drawing stick figures and your son is drawing, drawing facial features and embroidery on clothing. You know, I just always had a, God was always, in the, <laughs> God was always in the details for me and seeing things and always looking deeper. And so, yeah, I, I have to say, if I look at my life from any, like, you know, even the vista of now, there's been something creating me, you know, I love you know, that St. Francis Assisi, like, Lord, make me an instrument that I would love to just be a vessel of um, really just consciousness and creation. I don't want to get so esoteric, but I, I, it's how I, yeah, it's how I ask questions and answer them in my own way, my own sense of it. I would say for my soul more than anything, that's what I serve it for. You know, my, 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 I need to be engaging in that. And so that's the only way I know how to, to, um, you know, I, I also really believe in the realms of muses and wherever creation and ideas come from. So I think that I do it for that. Like, I love the fact that if I do the homework, if I have a vision, if I get a, an invitation to create something and I actually fulfill it, then it seems like there's a greater invitation next time. Okay, you did this. Look at this guy, John Morrow. He's, he's doing his homework over here. Let's give him this project. Let's see if he'll take this on. And then I do. And then more and more come to me. And then there's this almost language or I think all artists have a sensibility and a style and aesthetic all their own. And I find that the more I engage with that, the more refined and wild it takes me on this journey. So it's a, it's its own self perpetuating entropy that I get to get to follow along. So if you're an instrument, I, I deeply, deeply identify with that. I mean, in a weird way, I feel like when you spoke to me, when you reached out and Talk to me about your project, the 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 thing that you're working on about people's visions and all that. There was a sense of um, I don't know where to place this, but uh, I remember there was a channeled being, the cryon, <laughs> that said uh, uh, something about lighthouses. This is the insight that I I received from this. He was talking about like lighthouses. You don't put them all on one beach. You know, you, you scatter them, mm. you know, you, you make sure that there are lighthouses where there need to be. And with you, it feels like you and I are splinters of the same thing, mm. which is not unheard of, but it is, it is a rare and precious thing. How do you make sense of that kind of, like, when you talk about being an instrument, mm -hmm. you know, like... I don't know. I, this week I've been wearing this, this old necklace that my, my buddy, Charles Shaw, who has been on the show, he bought me this piece of obsidian glass that was wrapped into a pendant. And I've been thinking about it a lot and thinking about, you know, being the tip of the spear hmm. and being like a shard of something. And I'm, I'm curious what this evokes for you in terms of like how you understand yourself as a, a spark off of something greater or, you know, like, you know, where are you in, in relation to the, um, the larger thing in which you participate? I do believe, I think that there's a, you know, there's a Humpty Dumpty ness to myself that, that some being kind of fell and is putting itself back together. And I think that there's an organism that uh, whether that's the divine spark and it's one sort of light that we all sort of share or that shard or that crystal or that seed or that prism. Absolutely. I'm all, I'm all about that. I think that, um, you know, there's so many ways, there's so many entry points I could go to this question. There's a great quote that came to mind where I heard Richard Rohr, who's a, who's a um, kind of a contemplative Catholic. Uh, he's sort of up and I call him the, the, the Dalai Lama of Christianity because he's sort of upending Christianity from, from the inside out. And he said, the shape of God is relationship. And I really love that. I love that notion that in the same way, the energy isn't in the particles itself. It's in the relationship of the particles. It's in that sort of, it's in that dynamic state that's where the sort of real tension and friction and energy and, and, and connection can happen. There's something magical about that. So as a responsible, as a aware as I am right now and as aware as I want to continue to be conduit, there's something about polishing that obsidian in myself or whatever kind of crystal I am of saying, hey, I'm, I'm, freak, I'm, I'm vibrating, I'm frequency. And I see that 
the love that I have, despite all of my depressions or doubts or fears or, you know, worries or concerns or judgments, uh, there's something that radiates truer to what I would say I, both my most optimistic visions of the world, as well as what I have seen in mystical visions or ceremonies, that just feels true. And so I'm just doing my job to really hone this. I, 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 I you know, I did a toad ceremony not that, not that long ago, and, and I, I realized I, it was a very interesting distinction between God and Godhood. You know that there's, we have this body or this soul or this incarnation. And I was taken to this place that I had never been before where it was, it was kind of, it was really like the dark, the void, you know, darkness. I'm, I mean, I'm a color guy. I love color as art. And I've never really loved using black. You know, black is the sort of absence of color, right? But it's also sort of where creation begins. I just always, I love color so much. I don't, I don't like wearing like, black or dark or gray i love color like that's my that's my favorite thing i'll be obnoxious about about color and i was taken to this black place this dark pure consciousness place and it was just primordial like in, inside the womb of wombs complete nothingness and i saw it was primal consciousness and i I almost saw that. I don't even know if there's such a thing. I don't even know if the Bing Bang happened. <laughs> like it really was almost like a, a bang could have happened. But in that moment, a breath could have happened. And the breath could have also caused the Big Bang, you know? Or even like the slight, if it was a if it was an entity, it could have just turned over slightly. And that conscious movement could have shifted things into a beautiful act, you know? Not this sort of act of violence. But also saw in that moment of pure dynamism that if you couldn't if you didn't have the container to hold it you might lash out and it could be it could be a bang where i'm kind of going where with this is i noticed a the absolute like responsibility of consciousness it is if you have this ability there's something so beautiful about the gift of getting it and then the natural response is gratitude and so i think for me there's something there's this reciprocity that happens where i have this gift called first of all life called consciousness right and then these gifts that seem to have if they were coming up at first grade seem to be have been seeds planted inside me whether that's from past lives or who knows how that works and i i i just want to live in a state of gratitude and thanks and so I do my best to give back to that world. And so to be the shard that I am, you know, to say like, hey, this is, I got John Morrow this life. I'm going to like live it as fully as I can. You know, I heard too this other quote that said, on the day you die, the person you are meets the person you could have been, you know? And so that could be, mm. it could be, that could be filled with, you know, the things that you knew you had to do, but didn't do. And I'd rather just at the end know that I just left it all on the line. You know, that's what my heart is made of, you know? And it's not that I haven't got my butt kicked this life, you know, by kind of going at that and just been pummeled. But there's something like I want to I leave it. I want to, like, leave it all on the line as consciously as I can. This is not about a take or accumulate as much as possible, but I want to have my heart feel like a great workout, you know? And I, I, I did that. Like, I feel a sense of accomplishment, not in the – success or economics sense but just the accomplishment in the like i i live life <laughs> as fully as possible mm. so to the notion of time you know you brought up the big bang you know i like the idea that it was just sort of a the universe rolls over in bed you know that maybe we're, we're making too much of it but i mean that still implies you know a beginning there's a uh, a narrative arc is that how you understand time or, I mean, what is, is there more to it? Cause I've to possibly short circuit this question and certainly tip my hand. I think there's gotta be more to what's going on because especially lately, I feel like I've received some pretty intense confirmations that there were things going on before I was even born that were like building up in like a symphonic movement, you know, that, that there is, that there's a rhyme and poetry in the motion of events and that 
I mean, this is this is an ancient question. You know, it's like the is it Ptolemaic destiny? Is it foreordained? Wiggle around within the armature of what is, or is it yet unwritten? Like, I don't know where do you stand on all these things. I mean, these are huge, and I am I am at best wildly speculating, but happy to on conversations like these. So I would say I feel like, and again, the bet the closest I can kind of come is sort of you know metaphors and paradoxes, but I feel like the chicken and the egg are constantly creating one another. You know, it's a different kind of dynamic than which came first, like the sense of time or not, that there's some, it's more like the Ouroboros of anything. Like, you know, it feels more cyclical than anything. And it feels, you know, I've, I've been really interested in the cross, you know, as this symbol of, of, um, and this notion of Christic versus Christian. And this notion of, we have, you know, Kronos, the chronological time that we operate and we have Tuesdays and September 3rd, you know, and whatever, 1979. And then Kairos is more this feeling sense of time, this presence, you know, it's an eternal presence and both can exist. Um, And if you can meet them and almost begin to reference the vertical axis as a means to navigate the horizontal. You know, I mean, that's the stuff of Martin Luther King, the, the, you know, the justice has a, you know, has a long arc, but it bends towards mercy. And so if we can hold it Mm. in an infinite time or, or, or an eternal time, rather than our need that by Friday at 5 PM time, there's something that can happen differently. You know, I don't need to figure out time to be here, you know, when I've had moments of complete surrender and being willing to die at any moment, there's something given to me. You know, if I can, if I can slow down enough to be fully here, nothing is missing in all directions, you know, and that's exactly where I sort of always want to be. Um, and so, yeah, that's been a real, that's been a real study of mine just recently is how to access that vertical plane, that, that timeless place. While also, you know, I think there's been spiritual teachers that have said, you know, you have to, you have to realize your divine eternal nature as well as your social security number. You know, that's like, that's the paradox. You're going to have to know both of those and keep track of both of those. And that's what makes this sort of duality. There's this beautiful friction that happens. And I love that interplay, you know, and I forget all the time, but it always brings me back. And that there, there is something about, um, you know, the mystery being, again, I've heard this as a guy, Richard Rohr, but he said the, the mystery isn't infinitely unknowable. It's, it's infinitely knowable, you know, to keep understanding. And there's something just so beautiful about that. Like anytime I try to like put a container on it and know, if anytime I've ever done that in my life, life has come and like upended me and busted my, and bursted my, burst my bubble every single time. And I've always been grateful for it as painful as it might've been. And so, um, I don't, I've, I'm less concerned with time as a construct as much as a gift that I have to use it called this life. You know, I mean, really life is, life is a, occurrence a phenomenon between two points in time called birth and death right like and that's only possible because of these two points these two doorways right and so here's this we never know you never know when you're going to kind of come in or leave but while we're here here we are and i'm not sure what's on either i'm not sure what's on either side of either door but when i've peeked behind those veils it feels far more expansive than this quote unquote mundane world usually offers, but I'm not, but I'm happy for the constraints if nothing else for, for experience itself. So how does that work with respect to orienting yourself toward a goal, like or a purpose? Like, how do you, how do you think about your, like, why are you, why are you here? What is it that you feel that, you know, cause I don't know. I mean, I've, I spent a lot of my life, asking that question of myself and getting in some sense, like, like an obsidian blade chipped off. Like you're not this, you're not that. Like I was never told in so many ways what I was, I was told what I was not, 
you know, and then what's left over is what I do. Apophatic and cataphatic. Do you know those two terms? No, no, no. Talk to me. Okay. Apophatic and cataphatic are, it sounds like we were just describing and I forget which is which apophatic, I believe. And then uh, apophatic and cataphatic. So look, we can look them up to, to determine, but apophatic, I believe is God through negation. So it is not that, you know, you're, it is not that, it is not that. And then, uh, and then uh, cataphatic would be God by through like affirmation, you know, like God is good. God is wonderful. God is grace. God is life. You know, God is breath. And so there's something for me, I know you were talking about purpose and Dharma. I love that study. I do believe that I, I do believe for me, having meaning and having purpose gives me a structure rather than just being some amoeba amorphous like i'm just gonna let it all figure itself out i mean not that that couldn't be a meaningful wonderful life but there's something around discipline and rigidity that creates a container for learning for me and it creates a way to i don't know navigate navigate the world i mean to get anywhere i don't know if there's necessarily uh, there's that whole whatever that it's about the journey not the destination but to, even to be on a journey um Boundaries are required, you know. So there's a fantastic book that I highly recommend. It's the book that I always, people say you have one book to recommend. It's called The Great Work of Your Life by Stephen Cope. And it's all about Dharma, but it looks it through like the lens of the Bhagavad Gita. And then it takes all these historical characters like Beethoven and Susan B. Anthony and Harriet Tubman and Gandhi and Thoreau and watches them struggle with their Dharma. You know, we kind of know their stories of the great work that they've you know, that they've, uh, that they've provided and given to culture, but it shows them going through their own doubts and struggle and what he calls Dharma denial. And I love this notion of Dharma denial because I think we, I think at least I'll speak for myself. I've had this sense of what I came here to do and what I've, these visions that I have or projects that I want to create, but they seem bigger than myself and I can kind of shrink down or feel like I'm not up for the task or I don't have what it takes or any, any of those things. And there's this fire is to live fully and righteously and as an activist and as someone who's fully engaged with life. And sometimes we like to stay warm by the fire when it's really asking us to stand fully in it and be engulfed by those flames and to like live that, that passionately. And so that's a great, that's a constant invitation that I always try to stand up and live into. And anytime I have fully, everything, everything I have is needed. I'm fully, it's, um, I'm fully, use and that's all i really want is i want to be able to use all my faculties at once when i'm fully here all you know all senses lit up and so my dharma i do believe dharma is also a dynamic process it can change you can ask different things in different moments you know it's asking you different things to be a father and to be a husband rather than just be when you were you know by yourself in your 20s or whatever the thing is it, it can change and your dharma can shift along with what it needs to sort of teach you i would say for me right now what I've been calling my calling is that people live connected. And I love connecting people, uh, actual relationally, but also connecting them to their own purpose or to their own whatever sense of divinity, to, to connecting them to inspiration. I love living for that because that's where I love staying connected to. And so when I'm there and I've done so much work to stay there, I feel like there is a flow in the universe and there is a flow a life-giving flow that makes all an animating principle that makes all of this possible. And as someone who's touched upon it and drank from those waters, all I want to do is help other people find that, especially when I look out into the world and can get overwhelmed by despair or doubt or like, you know, give up on humanity or see the darkness. I, I have a real stance for it can be otherwise. And that otherwise is always happening. And it's just a conscious moment of being present away, a conscious breath away. So let's bring this down to street level a little bit and yeah. talk about what's what's going on like right now in, in 2020 and how this feels for you. Anchor all of your epistem in the current events of this moment of this extraordinary change and, and metamorphosis and explosive uprisings of, and grief and horrible stuff is going on right now. And also amazing, beautiful stuff is going on right now. It feels like we're living in the, like the dystopia and the utopia of dozens of different science fictions all at the same time. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, where you stand amidst all of that. 
the multitopia. Um, sure. Polytopia. Yeah. 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 Polytopia. Well, the project that I interviewed you for, uh, is a short film that I'm creating right now and I'm calling it the opening. And the opening was this vision I had pre pre COVID, but it was this vision of this giant hole, this, this immense laceration in the sky, you know, it was sort of at where the midday sun would be or the midnight moon. It's just there and can be seen from all continents and all hemispheres at any given time. And it acts as a, you know, during the day when there's blue skies, when you look through it, it's, it's, it's black and there's comets and constellations and space in there. And then at night, when you stare through it, it's blue skies and, and clouds and sunsets. And it acts as this prism. It acts as a prism where when light passes through it and touches down upon someone and they stare into it, they go through, you know, what could be called a, a hallucinate, hallucina- like, a, like a psychedelic experience and hallucinations. And it busts up all, it's, it, it really is a metaphor for a huge breach in like the limits of our imagination. And I think that's what's happening. I think we're sort of reaching the end of the way we've done things. And there are other considerations to be thought and new ideas to be birthed and other wisdom to be tapped into that's going to require probably stripping a lot of us down to those moments of grief, to those moments of despair, to those moments of hurt and anguish. Not that I'm condoning them, but as a means to say, we're not limited to or by them. You know, there's something still underneath that. And to kind of crack us open and have us touch upon our deepest vulnerabilities can shine where that light is, you know, where that light is in within, within each of us. So yeah, I'm creating a short film around that. I'm also, I love writing children's books. I'm working on two children's books right now. One's called Small Boys Be Brave. And it's about this little chickadee who lives on a farm and there's a long driveway that cuts to the farm and him and his family live on one side of that little driveway and he has like a bird house, a bird bath and a bird feeder. So he's kind of like hooked up by the system, so to say. And on the other ha- the other side of that little driveway, rolling meadows, a pond, spring fed pond, you know, a food for all four seasons and a barn. And on top of that barn is one of those fake owls, you know, meant to scare away pests. And so his family won't let him go past the road because there's this seemingly ominous figure there. And then uh, it takes place, you know, all four seasons. And and in the winter, this squirrel comes and sort of knocks over their bird feeder, this hungry, clumsy squirrel. And so all their food's gone. So small voice, which is a metaphor for his own intuition, has to go like, has to go face this sort of seeming threat and realizes it was, you know, this, this, it was nothing to be feared all along as his, as his sort of intuition had told him. And then the other book that's still percolating, but will probably hopefully come out sometime next year is this book called uh, Taking Things From Granted. <laughs> and so there's this sort of shadowy creature called Granted, who basically just takes, has taken all the things that we haven't been appreciating um, and kind of hoarding them in his, stockpiling them in his little cave or cauldron. And when this little optimistic character, um, you know, is looking around, is like, why is nobody like loving life? Why is nobody happy? Look at all these amazing things. Everyone just says, well, they've, you know, they're, Everyone just probably takes things for granted. He's like, who is granted and why, why are people taking things to him? So he goes on this mission and finds this, this character. And, you know, it's a story about gratitude and really appreciating all we have and what is essential when there's this whole stockpile and you can have everything back. What do you actually take? You know, what's actually there? So this is sort of what I do is I, I try to use, I think my soul tries to use the fine metaphors of the moment and contextualize them in as simple as possible stories and art forms that I can at least sense make and hopefully offer that up to, to people as well. Do you have a, a sense of like where you belong in a ecology, like a cosmic spiritual lineage ecosystem? Like, I don't know. I am definitely uh, poly about this kind of a, a, a question myself. For example, I was thinking lately about, you know, a friend of mine was, is, is very good about getting people to notice their pure mind and to reflect on pure awareness and all that. And I was thinking, I think that there's something to be said for being a catfish, mm. you know, 
being something that can like absorb that actually thrives on that can like mulch and is, is like part of a, a trophic network in which something that is like toxic or, you know, it's excrement for something for someone else. It's like, this is what, I, this is actually what I feed on. And I've been like going out and collecting broken glass every time I go out on walks and I've got this big, I've, I've got like a bucket of broken glass. Now mm. I'm like thinking of what do I, what do I want to do with this? You know, so I'm like the, the catfish, you know, the catfish is actually quite a noble creature. It's a lowly creature. It, it literally eats shit, but you know, so that's, that's a, uh, I guess a totem or something that I've been mm-hmm. identifying with lately. And I, I'm, I'm curious where you uh, where that li- line of thinking takes you and like where you find yourself amidst the, uh, the pantheon or the, um, the cosmic uh, taxonomy. Yeah. Beautiful question. I mean, I think I've had different totems throughout my life. You know, I would say I've always, I, amphibians have always spoken to me, you know, toads and frogs have just always been between the realms, things like that. I also had a big, you know, I grew up, helping monarch butterflies um, patch and sort of the cocoon and chrysalis. So these, so metamorphosis is probably a big thing for me. I also, I mean, I'm even wearing a shirt right now with a, a bison on it. There's um, this notion of bison being like something about so noble and just powerful and just standing where you are, you know, not having to use, like there's the lion who roars and sort of uses kind of brute ferocious force, but there's also something about this bison that resonates about being immovable, you know, being like, yeah, try to, try to mess with this thing. It's a mount. It's like an animal mountain, <laughs> but there is a notion of, I like your, I love your catfish metaphor of like, how do we, I do believe here on out, it's going to be a giant cleanup party from here on out. So what's, what are animals, what are fungi, what are fungi, what are, what's the cleanup party look like? Who are the siphoners, you know, and the sort of, um, yeah, those, uh, filterers of of the you know the peacock that can transmute poison you know and turn it and metabolize it i'm gonna think on that i can't i can't i don't have anything that comes immediately to mind aside from i do i try to do that with my art uh but i love this notion of where do i sort of stand but those are just the ones that i've always stuck with me is i would say frog and toad a monarch butterfly bison i've got some hummingbird in there hawk you know for vision hawkiness but I need a, a sort of a cleanup ally. So I'll, I'll, I'll think I'll call it in. Mm, the sponge. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, you called it, right? You said, you know, we're in, a, we're in a, a time when it's pretty clear. I think about this a lot, you know, being the father of a, a, a little, a tiny little girl. It's like the world that she grows up into. I, I read this thing recently that said that the stock market is not going to com- completely recover from coronavirus until 2035 and that like the logic seemed sound when i read it i i I can't recount the whole thing but it was saying basically that like economically speaking that we're in a kind of a, a a breakwater here but that from 2035 to 2050 things are going to be like really golden according to the long range prognostications of these palantir wielding weirdos and so what do you think about that like where do, where do you think we are in the in the song of this you know like uh what part of this composition do you think we're in and and like how does that guide your hand as far as the work that you do and and the the way that you stand in the world uh the advice that you give people the way that you listen and and react to the things that are going on around you? Beethoven's ninth, Ode to Joy. That's exactly, I mean, that's where we are, you know? Ode to Joy, you know, standing in front of a tank with life. That's, that's where I feel like we are, where there's systems and oppressions and tyrannies that are coming at us. And I believe the human heart and the spirit within just needs to keep singing, turn, cranking that song up. Yeah, that's where I think we are in the symphony. And I do believe that it's um, Bio Komalafe, who I've told you about. I'm not sure if you're, if you're going to, if you got him yet, but he has, he's such been such an inspiration to me. And he writes these little Facebook posts and sort of pontifications. And one was uh, 
he said like, you know, you're in a tyranny when, and he kind of had like bullet points and I forget, I forget all of them, but the one that really stuck out with me was the last one when it said, you know, you're a tyranny when eloquence has replaced what wants to be said. And so I really think about that, you know, like how we can pretend to know and like philosophize on what has to happen rather than just the guttural, here's what needs to be said. Here's what's happening. You know, the cries of mothers, that this shall not be so of fathers, of brothers, of standing up for what we actually believe dignity wise, spiritually, humanely, ecologically, all of that. I believe that. And I think that the only place you can do that is from referencing what we be want to be living for, you know, and that's where I always go to Ode to Joy is there is another river. There's another song being sung, you know, back to this great, whether that's the place we've come from or the place that we're heading to. And I don't, I'm not denying or even pretending that we don't need to actually go through this transition as harrowing as it probably will be. You know, I think this is a time, this is a time that is calling for people to bear radical disorientation, you know, and it's, The more you're orienting with the structures, the more disorienting it'll be. And so for me, when I go to like, I am up for the ride, you know, I am here for that river and being a comet or a flash or getting this brief candlelight glimpse of into life, I don't know what to do but sing and dance. And I think that's a, I think that's both what's missing. You know, there was another great quote, right? I really am not great at remembering all of them, like where the the origins come from. But it says something like, you can't get poetry from the news, but people die every day from what's not found there, you know, or from what can only be found in poetry. And so sometimes the most political acts is listen to Mozart, you know, or go dance barefoot in a meadow or skinny dip in a river, you know, or say hello to your neighbor, you know, like I think that's, a real political act of restoring what, you know, as Charles Eisenstein says, you know, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. So I'm on team that. I'm just on team that. And so whatever that's asking for and kind of putting my fingers on the pulse of that, what's being asked of that, you know, there's sometimes so many questions that aren't even being asked right now. We're looking at, when you look at the news, it's all going towards election and COVID and all these things. And I don't doubt that that, is a thing to be acknowledged and a thing to sort of take consideration. But sometimes I go, I just ask like, for what for? You know, like I I have to ask, especially in capitalism and the sort of Western culture that we've lived. And going back to even this Dharma question, like what is life for? I mean, is the point of life to be able to eat Fritos and watch Netflix? Because that's the sort of the ultimate comfort, you know? Because if so, we've got it. Like, is this the height? Because if so, we've created that. You know, we've created that for ourselves. I do believe there's more. And I'm not even, I'm not knocking entertainment or even convenience, but to recontextualize it with a deeper meaning is something that I just question. And I know it's a real delicate line because I can sound like I'm standing on some sort of moral high ground, which I never wish to do. But I always love upping the octave, taking things. So where are we in the song? For me, I'm like, Ring up the octave, even quietly, start it with whispers, but just know how incredible the crescendo can be or how, or the beauty in the silence and stillness, you know, of the sonnets. So yeah, that's where I go. Who do you feel accountable to? Mm. This is as simple as I can say, but right now I would say life itself. I do feel a real connection to the earth because that's because I'm here. I feel accountable to the people in my life, to the people I come in contact with. I think there's something really profound in the localization of, like, you know, love and serve and be present to who you're with as a means to sort of ripple out that into the world. You know, I used to have an Atlas syndrome trying to hold up the whole world, you know, save the whole world on my back. Um, But I can see that the most, and I, you know, I've, I've definitely got jaded by activism of trying to take too many things on and seeing, you know, how many fires there are to put out. And so I feel mostly accountable to the life in front of me and to create the, my little portion, if that's my own, I have, I have the gift of this body and all that I kind of bump up against all my molecules bump up against and the things I create too, but life itself to the gift of it. And I do think, like I said, 
is this paradox where there does seem to be this infinite and eternal notion of life, while also this boundaried sense of it, whether that is a body, whether that is that a time span of, of life itself that you have, or whether that's the finite universe, the finiteness of, of the planet, you know? We're dealing with a lot of paradoxes here. There's a guy, there's an uh, African-American economist named Thomas Sowell, who I think is, I guess he's sort of a, uh, he's controversial in a lot of circles, but he blew my mind one time, you know, because I was, you know, fighting for equality. <laughs> and he said something like, listen, it's physically impossible because of the finite amount of shorelines we have on the continents for everyone to have beachfront property. <laughs> as idyllic as that would be, or that thing that we want to have. And so this notion of, you know, these bubble bursting of this idyllic version of the world or life on earth or peace and harmony that I've wanted to have met with like the stark reality. I don't know. There's just something so crucifying and something about so humbling about battling and surrendering to that. And so my accountability is to Again, coming back to the, the vertical axis of infiniteness and the material axis of, of here and now, and always trying to consider to the best I can both of those. So within all this talk of limitation or constraint, um, you hit a wall somewhere. I mean, I mean all of us do, right? You, you, know, you, you realize that you have uh, stumbled or erred. What does that look like in your case? Like, how how has John Morrow screwed up recently? And like, how do you react in those moments? Like, how do you receive your own failure or error and and move from that point? I mean, learn from them for sure. That's how I move from them. Let's see. <laughs> Most recent. I mean, I don't know if I have like a recent recent. I've been in this weird farm bubble. I'll just say. A few things like I, I, the biggest giant, mis- the, the first big mistake I ever made was in my late twenties and I had an affair, you know, I had a, I, I, I had an affair with a, on a friend of mine's girlfriend, you know, and then we just fell, I fell completely into the, whether you want to call that lust or even just a lesson that needed to, that had to happen. You know, there was a lot of love there, but there was also some out of integrity thing. My own, my own sense of integrity, I crossed it. And so it showed me that there's also this part of me, whether that's the shadow or whether that's the ego or whether that's this, you know, insert seven deadly sins in there that wants to feed itself off these indulgences. And the, the version of the, the who I held, the John Morrow in my mind of who I held myself to be stepped way outside of that. And that was powerful to me and humbling. And so there's this, the chip on my shoulder became like a, an Achilles heel which I sort of now walk around with. And it's, I'm grateful for that. I'm always like, okay, there's my limits. You know, like I crossed my own energetic electric fence, you know, and I got shocked by it. And then I also did a deep dive spiritually, like real deep into Gnosticism and just felt like I hit my head at the bottom of it. And, you know, was definitely in a, what I would now call a cult, but I don't, I don't use, I mean, cult has such a negative term like terminology, I mean, I think America is a cult. I think any kind of you know group thing can be can be considered a cult. But I do believe that there's this sort of single leader who has connection to the divine and not necessarily encouraging others as peers in that same connection. You know, in, in encouraging or or engendering the same kind of connection. And I was very like, I found the path. I know the real path, like the real, real esoteric path. I had found that, and there was a. I lived for about five, six years in that of this righteousness, this sort of spiritual righteousness that I had sort of found, like the real, real way. It was a lot of medicine. I was doing a lot of ayahuasca at the time in that. And then, um, yeah, there was a situation in a moment in that group where there was a real kind of a break and some people stayed and some people left. And I was one of the people who left. And I went on what I would call like about a two year, like humble apology world tour, you know, of, of people that I might have just, you know, just slighted or kind of had a holier than thou, or like I was in this little ivory tower and like I was literally living like I had this place that had found God. And the irony was I was living as if that was the only place God was. So I made God very small. 
at that time. But again, I needed to like, ha- like I can see now in retrospect, needed to burst my own bubble to have a larger context. And now I can live and sort of see, yeah, what I would call the divinity in everything, you know, and even in boundary setting and even in boundaries, you know. Um, now that's a paradox that I have a hard time mentally wrapping my head around and living, but uh, one that the heart seems to know how to navigate far greater than I. But those are some big mistakes that I sort of made. And so my ambitions and my inspiration, you know, I'm an Aries, so I don't know if, you know, I'm an Aries, you can call that like this this sort of kind of catalyzing intrepidness going first. I take deep dives and I usually kind of hit my head or I'll find the edge first. I'll go all in on things, even like bands, you know, back in the whatever, like, you know, high school or college, I'll be all, I'll just be fully immersed and thinking that this whole world is all it is until I kind of, until something sweeps the, you know, takes out the rug from underneath my feet or I hit my head on it to then realize, oh, there's even more. There's something, another, this is a quote by James Finley. He says, God protects us from nothing, but sustains us through everything. And I love that because that's like ultimate vulnerability as well as sustenance and nurturance underneath it. And so that's what I found. We kind of like have to hit our head and going back to the obsidian metaphor, what a great way to like polish ourselves. You know, like we're like, we're like in a rock tumbler, just getting bumped around and nicked around and then slowly sort of polished. I'm losing my hair. Like it's like a, you know, I'm just getting like noogie by God and like, and, and yeah, polished into, into this beautiful version of myself that, I, w- I couldn't have self-constructed, but so clearly needed to have happen for the openness and roundness and, you know, ultimately more bountifulness of my heart. That's awesome. John, okay, so the last, the last question I have for you is the sort of standard boilerplate future fossils tie a bow on it question, which is, let's assume you're in a conversation with your future self uh, and that you can take any way you want in terms of what, how you would define that self, whether that means you, whether that means other people, the unborn, some sort of expansive version of yourself that you're incapable of accommodating currently. What do you say to that person or that entity? And then what do you want to know from them? So what I, what do I tell them? Okay. So I would say, let's see. Some version of just go for it. Just go for it. You know, go for it. That's actually what I think. Go for it and trust you're held. Yeah, go for it and trust you'll be provided for and nourished and loved every step of the way. And then I'd want to ask them. Yeah, some version of what mantra can I say? to get me from here to there. You know, what's a, what's a guiding principle? And if I were to try to answer that, I mean, this has just been a guiding principle in my life. It would be, yeah, what are you grateful for? <laughs> I think gratitude really is a, it's almost a vessel to travel the world through, and it seems to leave no harmful wick in its path. Like it seems to stitch and unstitch beautifully you know and it seems to be it, that i don't know what uh, that's almost more the totem that i'd be looking for is there is there a, is there a grateful being you know that gratitude would be the and regenerative Re- gratitude is regenerative so yeah i think um the question i would ask is how do i live regeneratively and how do i honor life to the work i do those are the questions i got well all right <laughs> thank you Thank you, John. You're welcome. It's been fun. <laughs> Super fun. I, 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 I really enjoy talking to you. I really look forward to getting this out for folks. And and I eagerly anticipate the the yin-yang version, you know, me on you, or you on me, or whatever the hell that was, the first one. And I really, your work is beautiful. I want people to go to johnmorrow.com and, and look at all of the extraordinary things that you have made all of the the beautiful art that you've created and uh, to, to subscribe to your, your emails and so on. I mean, I, I mean that sincerely, like, I, I think that you're just like a, a good influence on me and on, and that must presumably on other people. So, um, 
thank you for taking the time to talk, man.